This video is sponsored by Suzanne Japan. Hey everyone, this is Chris from Third Coast Craftsman and in this video I'm making what I'm calling a hallway table, but it could be an entryway table, a sofa table, or even a TV console table. And if you follow my channel, you'll know that I'm a really big fan of Japanese woodworking and architecture, and in this design I took inspiration from Japanese temples. I've always thought that Japanese temples with the upswept curves on their roofs were some of the most beautiful things that mankind has ever made anywhere, and so I've always wanted to incorporate some of those lines and so I tried incorporating that with this table. I'm using quarter sawn white oak and black walnut for this build and I start by rough dimensioning the lumber with my miter saw and table saw. Once I have my pieces cut to rough size, I'm going to take them over to the workbench and grab my most beloved tool in the shop, my grandpa's number five hand plane. If you follow the channel, you probably know the story about that and the sign that I made. And I'm going to smooth and square the edges and get them ready to start laying out the joinery. So these are my side pieces and once they are smooth and square, I'm going to use a combination of marking gauges and marking knives to lay out the joinery. Because all this joinery is exposed and visible, it's super important that I'm very accurate with my layout, not only for aesthetic reasons, because these joints are gonna invite people to look closely at them and I don't want a bunch of ugly gaps everywhere, but also from a structural integrity standpoint, this project uses no hardware and there's only glue in a couple minor spots and it's designed to be able to be disassembled if it ever needs to be and so well-fitting and properly designed and cut joinery is gonna be crucial to its strength and ability to last generations. So I'm really gonna take my time on the layout and I'm using very sharp marking knives and gauges to create my lines to cut to. These side pieces have a similar design to a large bookshelf that I designed and built several years ago where the lower half is solid and has a single large tenon running through it to support the lower shelf. And then it splits into two and has two smaller tenons running through each one of those splits for the upper shelf. I used my bandsaw for the heavy cutting but needed to use my fret saw to finish the cuts to remove the middle. I'll clean those cuts up later on but for now it's time to start cutting some joinery. I'm going to start with the tenons that will mate into the feet. I'm going to use my Japanese saws by Suzanne Japan who is the sponsor of this video. And for most of my fine cuts I'm going to use a combo of their two Dozuki saws. The one with the black back is their fine cross cut saw and the one with the silver back is their fine rip cut saw which I actually designed for them when we first started working together and so I may be a little biased but I have to say that saw is awesome. It's their only rip tooth Dazuki saw and so for any cuts that you're going with the grain like for dovetailing and small tenons it's an absolute must have and when you pair it with that cross cut saw you have just an awesome dynamite combo for any kind of fine joinery out there. They're very affordable, and honestly, Suzanne has been a great company to work with too, but I'll provide links to these two saws, as well as the two-sided Ryoba saw and a flush cut saw that you'll see me using later on, and a link to a full video where I explain everything you need to know about Japanese saws down in the description, so make sure you check all those out. And a big thanks again to Suzanne for sponsoring this video and helping me do what I get to do. After removing the weights with my fret saw, I'm gonna chop down to my line with a chisel and I'm always gonna work in from both sides, meeting in the middle.
I use a bitten brace and bore in from both sides to remove the bulk of the waste and then I'm going to chop out the rest using my chisels. I leave about a 32nd of an inch of material for my final pass because I find if I try to chop to the final line with any more than that, my chisel is going to push my line back and I'm going to get gaps. Then to ensure extra support for the shells and to help prevent them from twisting, I'm going to add some 8 inch deep dados that extend past the end of each mortise. Next I'm going to prep and lay out the through tenons for my two shells. I'm actually going to use the side pieces themselves to transfer and lay out my tenons and any time that I can use the actual work pieces that I'm using for a project to lay out joinery, I'll always do that rather than trying to use measuring tools, it's just way more accurate that way. I'll darken my lines with a pencil and then cut to my lines using my Ryoba saw. Even though the Ryoba saw is a little more aggressive than the Dazuki saws, it still has a very fine curve and it's incredibly accurate and I always feel comfortable and confident cutting straight to my lines when I use that saw. And because the Ryoba saw doesn't have a back, you can make deeper cuts. For the feet, I just laminated two pieces together and again I'm going to square and flatten those with my hand plane and lay out the mortises to match the tenons that I already cut in the side pieces. So this project took me a really long time. Now obviously hand tools can take a little longer, but really not as much as people think. This was just a really complicated project with a lot of intricate joinery that I really had to slow down and take my time on. It also took a lot of hours of design work. I estimate it took me around 300 hours to design and build this. And I did some research, read some forums, read a good article that the Wood Whisperer did about labor rates for woodworking, and I came up with an hourly rate of $50 an hour. Now some people may scoff at that number, but considering the years spent practicing and developing the skills to be able to hand build something like this and the tools I've had to acquire, I think $50 an hour is a very fair rate. So by my calculations, this table is worth about $15,000 dollars and that's not including materials but you know what i don't think i could ever sell it to me these projects are priceless because i made them with my own two hands and i don't think anyone would ever be able to appreciate them as much as i would and fortunately i have this youtube channel and even though i won't come close to recouping the total cost of my labor hours on this i still feel very fortunate that i can still make a comfortable enough living doing what i love to do and that's because of people like you watching supporting me and sponsors like suzanne so big thank you to you guys I'm going to draw bore the mortise and tenon for the feet and if you don't know what draw boring is, it's when you offset the holes through the mortise and tenon in such a way that when you drive a peg or dowel through the joint, it'll pull that joint close together. And I have a scrap piece of wood inside the mortise to prevent blowout on that unsupported inside edge. I use a brad point bit to create a center mark, then move that mark very slightly towards the shoulder of the tenon and then drill the offset hole at that new location. I'll assemble those later on, but now it's time to start on the top, which is my favorite part of this project. This is gonna be a split top design and I'm bumping up the thickness to inch and a quarter with the upswept black walnut breadboard ends. I sketched this idea out and it took me a lot of head scratching to figure out how I was gonna actually accomplish it. The order of operations was really important on this and the first thing I needed to do was lay out and start cutting the haunched tenons in the ends of my two top boards. A haunched tenon is kind of like having a tongue and groove joint but with a tenon in the middle of it. The extra tongue and groove section on the ends of the tenon give direct support to the full width of the board and will prevent the edges of the boards from twisting and helps keep that top really nice and flat all the way across. Now these long shallow cuts are actually pretty difficult to do so I like to clamp a sawing guide when I'm doing this to prevent any damage to my finished surfaces and I'm just going to saw off my line slightly on both the shoulder and the cheek of the tenon and then I'll chop to the shoulder line with a chisel and then I'll use my router plane to get a perfectly flat and consistent cheek.
With those tenons done, I can now start working on the upswept breadboard ends to hopefully accomplish that Japanese temple look. And how I figured out how to do this is actually pretty cool, at least in my opinion. But first I have to do a little dimensioning. Now my walnut is still rough sawn, so I got to use a couple cool old machines that are still pretty new to me, and I think it's the first time they're being shown on the channel. I'm first gonna flatten and make square an adjacent edge and face on this Yates American 20 inch joiner, and then thickness the board on this gigantic old 24 inch Powermatic planer. Then I can rip to final width on my table saw referencing that previously jointed edge. This board will make up both breadboard ends and I'm gonna leave it whole for now. I'll clean up the faces with a hand plane and then lay out and plow a groove that's gonna match the haunched part of those corresponding tendons that I cut on the top boards. I'm gonna be using an old wooden plow plane to make this groove and these planes can be a little tricky to set up and use but with some practice, they really do a nice job and are a lot of fun to use. One of the tricks besides a really sharp blade is to start off at the far end and take short strokes and then slowly start taking longer strokes until you're taking a full length pass. At this point, I was able to cut my walnut board in half so I had two breadboard ends, and then I could mark out and start cutting my mortises. Even though this is a relatively narrow top, I'm still going to account for wood movement by making the outside edges of the mortises a little bit wider than they need to be to allow for expansion room for that tenon. With a little template I made, I traced out the curve shape of these breadboard ends, and here's the way that I came up with to make these upswept curves. I've seen people use a table saw to cut coves before, and even though it seems kind of sketchy, it seemed like it was going to be the best way for me to get close to that inside curve. And after practicing it a couple times, I actually felt very controlled and safe, so I did feel comfortable running the boards that I spent so much time working on through that jig. The key was just going at a slow, steady, controlled rate of feed and doing it in several small passes, not trying to take too much off at once. Now this is definitely not a technique that a table saw manufacturer is going to recommend. And even though I felt safe while doing this, I'm gonna go ahead and say, don't copy me and try this one at home. Now that that coal was cut to create the one curved end, I can stand the board on edge and rip it down to width to match the thickness of my top. With this little squirrel tail block plane and a card scraper, I can now finesse the transition from that flat to the curve to get the shape that I'm after. Now here's one of the parts in the build where order of operations was really important and I had to make sure that I didn't do one step prematurely that would cause me problems with future steps. So before I do the outer curve, I'm going to drill my draw bore holes into the breadboard. I'm also going to elongate the outer holes of the tenons to allow for wood movement. And I always really like to add a small chamfer to my mating edges on a breadboard joint and it really makes a nice shadow line. Then I'm going to cut out some decorative accents on the breadboards with the bandsaw and using the table saw I can remove a large amount of waste on my outside curve. But before I'm going to refine that outside curve I'm going to go ahead and permanently attach the breadboard ends to the top and I'm going to use a mallet to be able to strike that remaining flat edge to seat that joint nice and tightly together. I only add glue to the inside two inches of each tenon so that the top can still expand and contract to the outside. And I'm gonna drive my pegs through the hole and add a touch of glue so that it only goes down about a quarter of an inch just into the breadboard ends and not into the tenons themselves. Using a Suzanne Japan flush cut saw, I'll cut my dowels flush to the top, and then I'm gonna add some bow ties to the top to add some strength and stability. So after I added the breadboards, I actually cut out several different shapes and styles of bow ties. 
out of cardboard and I laid them out over the top in a bunch of different configurations and layouts and numbers and sizes. And I would take a bunch of pictures of them on my phone and I shuffled back and forth between the different pictures and eventually narrowed it down to this design. It's really simple with just the three bow ties centered in the middle. And I really liked the size and shape of them. I thought they looked classy and elegant because I've seen many bow ties on different projects that look really tacky. So I really tried to avoid that and I'm pretty happy with how these turned out. Now I'm gonna flip the top over and finish refining that outer curve using a small smoothing plane that I made several years ago and don't give nearly enough attention to, so I'm giving it some love here. And I really should pick this thing up some more because it was a lot of fun to use and works awesome. Next, I'm gonna work on the two curved horizontal stretchers that will help support the top so that it doesn't sag under any heavy weight that I might put on it. And I tried to design these so that they continued in that Japanese temple look. Now I'm gonna make a couple sliding dovetail supports that will be mounted to the underside of the top and they'll work with those bow ties to really help keep that top flat and secure. Again, with the long shallow cuts, I like to clamp a guide and I made up a special 10 degree guide many years ago to use when I cut these sliding dovetails and that's what I have clamped on here. I kept my guide slightly off my line when using the saw, but then I'm gonna clamp it directly on my line and pare down using a chisel to get my finish cut. Now I need to make the corresponding female portion of the sliding dovetail into the underside of the top. Now this is a stop dovetail, which means it doesn't go all the way across. And because of that, I need to chop out the far end with a chisel. And this is gonna give the front end of my saw a little bit of room for the stroke and also a place for sawdust to go. Because this was a pretty long cut, the handle of my Japanese saw was getting in the way of my guides. So I ended up grabbing an old Western saw that I had laying around and it got the job done just fine.
And like before, I stayed off my line when sawing, and once I'm ready, I'm gonna use my guide and cut straight to my line, removing that last 32nd of an inch and referencing that 10 degree angle on my guide. Now I'm going to cut the dividers for my bottom shelf and these will be secured using through mortise and tenons. After I cut all the tenons, I'll use those to lay out the corresponding mortises. It's important to note that I really keep track and label all my components and where they're gonna end up because these are all handmade and there's gonna be variances in them and they aren't exactly interchangeable. So if I don't keep track, I'm gonna end up with problems. Next, I'm gonna make the tusks for the tusk through mortise and tenon for the shelves. Now, these joints are a pain, but I really like them for a couple reasons. One, they look really great, and two, they add a ton of strength and stiffness to a project. If I didn't have these tusks through the shelves and I didn't design the upper walnut stretchers the way I did, then this thing would really rack and wobble side to side really badly over time and just eventually fall down. But these tusks or wedges kind of act like mini knee braces and they really make a project rock solid. And a third thing, you can also take the project apart when you use joinery like this. Now I'm gonna cut the slots that my upper horizontal stretchers are gonna drop into. The bottom of them have an angle to match the angle on the stretcher ends, and a wedge will be driven between the top of the stretcher and the underside of the top to provide some nice back pressure that's really gonna lock the whole assembly together rock solid. Then I'm gonna work on the sliding dovetails that are gonna connect the sides to the top. Now I went back and forth for months while building this, trying to figure out how exactly I was going to attach the top to the sides. I went back and forth between through wedge mortise and tenons and some sort of sliding dovetail method. And I finally came up with this solution at this point in the build. I kind of needed to see it mostly done and I dry fit it up to figure out exactly what I was gonna do and how I was gonna accomplish it. And I came up with this slotted or keyed sliding dovetail idea where I would be able to drop the top onto the sides and then slide the top with the sliding dovetail stretchers that are also mounted into the bottom of the top, slide that forward about an inch and lock everything into place. I know that all sounds really confusing, but hopefully it'll make sense when you see me assemble this later on. Well folks, all my pieces are cut and ready for final assembly. Now this took me about 200 hours to build and to be honest, I'm really proud of this project and it's the sort of thing I wanna be building and using traditional methods that I wanna be using, but it was not very conducive to spend so much time building and editing a project if I wanna to continue to grow the channel. So if you aren't already, please consider subscribing to make this worth it. <laughs> it's free and helpful to the channel. Comment down below, let me know what you think. Did you like this kind of build? with 
all my commentary and please do share this video if you would as well. Now I'm gonna rush through this assembly process here because I already made a dedicated video just on the assembly of this. It's a really cool process and I talk a lot more about it and why I did certain things. So I'll put a link to that video down below. So feel free to go check that out if you haven't already. Now I didn't make plans for this project yet. It's something that I might do if there's enough people that are interested. And if you're interested in getting plans for this, please email me at thirdcoastcraftsman at gmail.com. And if I get enough emails about that, I'll go ahead and send all my sketches off to a professional and get some nice plans drawn up. You can see here how that tusk pulls that joint really tight together. To give the wide span of the top some load bearing strength, I made this little central support that will tie into the horizontal stretchers and therefore the top. I kept the bottom tenons a little bit loose to give me a little wiggle room to ensure my half lap joints would meet up with those stretchers. All right, so I'm stopping these an inch shy of being fully seated because when I drop my top in, it needs to slide an inch into place. So I have sliding dovetails for how the sides attach to the top here and they drop into the sockets and they slide an inch forward into their dovetail spot. So I need to leave this an inch back so that those cross stretchers, those horizontal stretchers are able to seat in here and then we should be able to bring everything together at once. And now you can see how the central post support lines up with the stretchers and how the stretchers and sliding dovetail supports all lock into their half lap joints when the top drops onto the sides. And now I can slowly start knocking the sides and supports the rest of the way home into their sliding dovetail joints to lock the top into place. This ends up being a very strong attachment, stronger than I think you could actually get with metal hardware. And I can always reverse this and take it all apart again. So I've been seeing the hype with Rubio Monocoat for a couple years now, so I decided to give it a try with this project and I gotta say, I really liked it and it's definitely gonna be my go-to finish for now on. I used the two-part oil and after it cured, I applied a second coat with their maintenance oil and then buffed those both out really, really good and it gave it the perfect amount of sheen. It feels great to the touch and it looks amazing, so I think it's gonna probably be my new go-to finish. Well everyone, she's all done. This project was a ton of work, but I absolutely love how it turned out. I definitely feel like it's my best work to date, and I hope you enjoyed watching me build it. Thanks again Suzanne Japan for sponsoring the video, and thanks again for watching. See you next time.